just make yourselves comfortable and, uh, and enjoy. So uh, Mobile Portland is uh, a meeting that's been going on for multiple years. I want to say something like five years. So we were here six and a half years. We were here before mobile was mobile. And um, so it's a well-established group. We meet here every month. So we'd like it if you keep on coming. We'll be here every month. It's the fourth Monday of every month. So we're going to uh, have a presentation and we'll have uh, some Q&A. And, uh, and then if you want, you go for beers over at the Shoots Beer Brewery afterwards. So we always have a mobile topic, um, and um, we are, we've been at mobileportland.com for a long time, and uh, now we started using um, meetup.com. So if you uh, have kind of registered before at Mobile Portland, then uh, please go ahead and go over to meetup.com and kind of add yourself there as well. We're going to continue emailing out to the, uh, the old group as well, so uh, you'll still get those announcements. Just, uh, just thanks to our sponsors. Um, first of all, the Urban Airship is helping us by providing the space. Ramsey, can you? I don't know, can I? Oh yeah, there it goes. Can you give us a couple words? Sure, uh, so I work with Urban Airship. Um, yeah, we've provided the space. If you guys have any questions about what Urban Airship does, what I do with Urban Airship, or why it's called Urban Airship, um, feel free to come talk to me afterwards and I will explain some of those things. And uh, Rivermark Credit Union is another uh, sponsor. Rob? a proud sponsor of this group just because, uh, again, we see, get so much energy and uh, excitement and great ideas just out of um, participating in this group. There's not any easy direct translation uh, to us sponsoring and uh, participating, but it actually has been very valuable for us for quite a few months and planning to continue to do it. I don't know if I actually have that on the Mine works. Uh, <laughs> technical support here. So yes, and, and ProFocus is another sponsor. Actually, I am the president of ProFocus. We're a technology staffing company, and uh, we do a lot of work in a lot of different technologies, including mobile development. And we have a, um, a position open, our, and uh, it's a, a cloud infrastructure engineer for a mobile app company. Um, and it includes uh, mobile device management um, in the job. And then we also have an Android uh, developer position opening up here in just about two weeks. Um, so, does anybody want to announce a job opening? Or other groups? Any other, other announcements about other groups or things that are coming on and happening?
Anybody else? Okay, good. All right, so we can move on to our speaker. We have a really great speaker today, very exciting uh, topic. Um, it's Jonathan Karen. Um, he is with New Relic. And as we all know, uh, New Relic is a, a performance monitoring company, specifically um, for, well, for websites and mobile apps. I think it's websites too. So, yeah. And, um, but uh, Jonathan works in as the mobile engineering manager. And he um, is there seeing and experiencing all the time companies that have high performance apps and companies that, that have slow apps. Um, so he is going to be talking with us about the common causes of slowness of apps um, and how to fix them. And then also to talk about a software design methodology that he has that uh, can help you prevent these kinds of problems right from the beginning. So with that, I'll hand it over to Jonathan. Hello. Hey, it works. Hi. So I am going to take a moment to hand this back to John. The one in Massachusetts is a lawyer. Uh, the one in Oregon is a software person. So lucky for you, I'm the one who looks your bargain. Unfortunately, the lawyer's pay rate is higher than mine, so I don't block it off. Um, but that's not why I'm here. Um, I'm also not here to advertise New Relic, um, but that's why it has a very small logo. <laughs> But, um, but as John was saying, New Relic's business is providing software to other developers who then use our software to monitor and manage their web and mobile applications and understand how they work out in the real world. So not in tests, not in development, but when you have a million users hitting your website or 10,000 mobile users suddenly fire up your mobile app, what happens? Right? This is not something that is easy to know unless you have eyes inside people's phones, uh, which you're not really allowed to do, at least on Apple. Um, so what we do is we provide software that you put in your web servers, you put in your mobile servers, you put it in your JavaScript, in your web browsers, um, you install it on your servers or in your database, and we just keep track of all the details of what's happening and report that back to you in a nice aggregate view that shows you where problems are. Um, so I lead the engineering team for our mobile product, and thus uh, have the dubious privilege of dealing with all of the vagaries of Android and iOS platforms that we support. Uh, so over the last 18 months, we have monitored the performance of over a billion installations of mobile applications uh, across iOS and Android and across the globe. Uh, and that's a lot of software installs. Uh, it's a little bit daunting to think about the fact that my code is running on all those devices. And then we're doing things like timing 50 billion network requests per week across Wi-Fi and cellular network. Okay. Still there. Yeah, 50 billion network requests all over the world, all the cell carriers. Um, it's a lot of data. And tonight what I'd like to do is, is kind of interpret some of that data for you and hopefully help you write better apps that are faster and more pleasing to people. Um, but before I dive into the technical details, let's talk a little bit about mobile users. Uh, again, this billion number keeps showing up. There are a billion smartphones in the world. Right? That is like what, one in seven or one in eight people in the world is holding one of these things like every single day and doing something with it and they live by it. Um, so think about all the users you could be out recruiting right now instead of sitting here listening to me talk. But what happens when we have this many users? Um, is anyone familiar with this technology adoption life cycle? Uh, it's, it's a 
fairly simple, interesting kind of researchy idea where you start out with innovators who are these people who are like really interested in just what the heck is possible with some new device or some new piece of software. And then you get into these people we call the early adopters, and they're sort of like, oh cool, this phone has software on it, no one knows what it does, but maybe it'll help me like figure out how to solve my problems. And they'll spend a ton of time and effort trying to figure out how to use your new shiny toy in their life. Right? And eventually they'll either say, like, oh, this is cool, I think I can use this to like reduce the amount of paperwork I file on a daily basis, or they'll say, I don't really understand what this does, and if you're smart, you listen to them and you figure out how to iterate on that, and that's a whole startup product market fit kind of thing. Uh, but then you get into what this graph calls the early majority, right? And these are people who really don't care how your app works or what it does. What they care about is easing the pain that they go through on a daily basis in life, right? So they are looking at you saying, show me how this will solve one of the problems I already know I have, um, hopefully with very little training, uh, but you know, why don't you hand me a user manual, right? And that's kind of weird coming from a background of like these mobile apps that don't have a manual and we don't even want that and we want people to just discover how they work. Right? We're starting to get to the point where that's not always going to cut it. Um, you know, anyone who's selling like enterprise workforce software will understand that you go into a company and they say, great, train us on how to use this. It's not as simple as just sending it out there and hoping that people use it. So it turns out that globally, a billion users is somewhere right in that mainstream user base in the early adopter, in the, the early mainstream phase. Right? So mobile is really mainstream now and we're no longer going to be able to get away with just letting people try and figure out how to use the things we're proposing to them. They just don't want to do that. Right? They would rather judge you on whether what you're proposing to them will obviously solve a problem they already know they have. Uh, and that brings me to performance. Uh, I'm here to talk about performance. Um, the first time I did a talk on mobile performance, everyone in the audience uh, who showed up was a marketing person. And they were really interested in the performance of their marketing campaigns and what their conversion rates were like. Right, which I was like coming from a software background, I was like, what? I don't understand. But, um, but it makes sense, right? I mean, there, there is this whole industry around getting people to use your software. And they care about metrics like conversion rate and install and uptake and retention because you're spending real dollars to get people in. Um, you know, if you care about getting people to use your app, those are critical concerns. But then what happens once people start using your app and they actually install it and launch it and try it for the first time, right? 62% of people, users, say, this was like a year ago, who knows what's happened since, um, say they will just delete your app if it freezes up or if it does not respond quickly. Um, does anyone happen to know like what the cost of a targeted click-through is from like Facebook for a mobile ad trying to get someone to install your app? 250. 250? Okay. Um, that's about what I remember it being a few years back when I was doing iOS stuff for myself. Um, do you happen to know what the conversion rate is from click-through to install and use? Okay. Well, let's assume it's like 1%, which is kind of a nice generic number that is kind of what I remember from web app days. That means that if you're spending $2.50 per click to get someone from a website looking at your promo page, right, and then 1% of those people are actually converting all the way through to someone who will launch the app and try it out once, that's hundreds of dollars per person just to get someone into your software. So how your users perceive that your app runs should be a huge, huge issue for you, right? Why would you endanger maybe two-thirds of your customer base simply because your app is slow and they get frustrated? Um, to me, performance is all about creating that frustration-free user experience, right? Where someone can just come in and feel like things are happening according to their agenda and not waiting for you as the app developer. Um, now note I said feel. That they don't have to actually have everything happen instantaneously. We'll talk about that. Um, so, with that in mind, tonight I want to cover three common problems. Um, the most common performance problems, right? What these things are, 
um, how I have seen people go about fixing them, how I fixed them myself, and then um, taking a little bit of time to think about how we can avoid having to fix them in the first place because we didn't create these problems. Um, so those are sort of the outline for the rest of the talk. And if anything gets boring, just start booing and I'll speed up. <laughs> Because uh, I had so much content I wanted to talk about, and there was no way to fit it into a short hour or however much time we have until they start kicking me out. Um, so, just let me know how it goes. Um, so, the three most common causes of bad user experience, the things I call the trifecta, um, there is always networking, network access from the phone out to the internet and back. Uh, there is processing of data that you never expected to see code is not designed to handle the things that the user threw at you. And then there's accessing slow hardware features like cameras or syncing over Bluetooth or you name it. Right? Those things that everything's going great and then the phone just pauses while something mechanical or handshaky happens. Um, so let's spend a minute talking about each of these and what we can do to deal with them. Uh, network latency is the time it takes from when your phone asks the internet for something to when that thing has been delivered back to your phone. Um, many apps use RESTful APIs over HTTP, and so there's all of this TCP negotiation and DNS lookups and cellular to internet bridging and packets going back and forth, right, and, and shuffling stuff. And at the end of the day, what your phone has to do is find a server that it wants to talk to, send out a request for information, wait for the server to get all that information together, and then retrieve the information back over the internet. Uh, and if it's something like you're sharing a phone of video or a photo or something, there's also that period of time where you're waiting for a whole lot of packets for the data to move one direction or the other over the wire. Um, so what problems can this cause? Well, first of all, your user can sit there staring at the phone, waiting for the phone to go and get data and bring it back. A great example of this is like a simple image gallery, right, where you click the button on your phone and you say, great, show me the image, is, and, and there's a lot of thumbnails to download, right, and your phone will sit there and go, okay, get a list of the thumbnails, and now go out and get the first thumbnail and download it. Oh, but wait, download the big image, because the user might want to zoom in later, and now we have to pull like a megabyte of data down over the cell network, and now we have to like crunch through all of that JPEG data and decompress it and put it on screen and use up a ton of memory, and now we'll go get the next one, right? And in the meantime, there's these little squares on screen going pop, 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 pop. Um, and that's a frustrating, you know, even when it works well, it's still a frustrating experience. Um, so how can you solve that sort of problem of just waiting for information? Uh, for one thing, I mentioned the, the stuttering, right? If you download a really big image and the actual code that asks for that image is, is in your UI thread and it's sitting there waiting for the network request to finish, then the screen's frozen, right? There's nothing that your app on Android or iOS can do to get past that and even keep like a nice little spinner or animated progress bar moving. Um, so you can move that stuff <coughs> off of what's called, often called your main or UI thread into the background. But then it gets a little more complicated, right? Because now you're dispatching this request, and you've got one piece of code sitting there updating the UI, and another piece of code actually doing all the grunt work of pulling back the data. And then it has to load it into memory, and it has to decompress it, and it has to get it back to the UI thread so that you put it on screen because the other threads aren't allowed to touch the screen. So it's complicated, right? Um, but there's some really good patterns that have been built out for this. Um, if you're on Android, Async task is a great way to make this simpler. Um, it lets you basically say, here's a job, call this function back on the UI thread when it's done, go to it. Um, iOS, there's actually some great libraries like AF Networking that do a lot of this for you as well. Uh, the other thing that we bump into a lot, is, so that's sort of like, don't run too much stuff on your UI thread, right? Because it'll make your app screech and halt and your frame rate will drop and people will be really frustrated. <coughs> Um, a second problem is that idea of the images going pop, 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 one at a time, right? That's not great. What if we could pull them all down at once? Well, that'd be better. Then they all appear 
more or less at the same time, and it would take less time, except if you put too many things at once on the network, you will, the overhead of each request will kind of like force the other requests out of the TCP stack, and you'll overload your cell connection, and it's a mess. So there's sort of this magic number that you can get to with some experimentation, and I'm just going to say it's around three, um, where if you're doing like three different network requests at a time, that's kind of optimally efficient. And if you're pulling down one bit of information at a time, well, there's going to be a lot of time just waiting for those packets to get to one end and back. And if you're pulling down 12, then you're just sending so many packets that none of them can get across the radio, and it's a mess. So somewhere in the middle, call it three or four, there's a nice balance there, right? And again, things like async task and if networking actually have pool management. So you can say, go off and download these 100 things, but please do them four at a time. And it'll just take care of that. And then the first four that you put in, well, the first one that you put in will start, and the other three will start, and then whichever one finishes first will come back, and then it'll start the next one, and you get this nice cascade. And, you know, in effect, you're not going to get like a hundred times faster networking, right? But you will at least like have or quarter the amount of time someone sits there waiting for the network. Um, and then the third way to address this, right, we're talking about all of this networking and requesting lots of different things. You know, what if you think about your APIs, right? If you control both sides of this connection, your server can have a language for asking for more than one thing at once. Right? You could develop a protocol where you say, I'm going to need the photos and, you know, biographies of everyone talking at this conference in one request, right? And what comes back is a big old pile of data. And then in your app, you can decode that and break it apart. And now you've reduced like 20 or 30 network requests down to one. A lot less overhead, things move a lot more quickly. But not everything is rosy in networking land, um, right? You know, if a network request never completes, um, it might take a minute, it might fail instantly. How do you recover from that? There are many, many different types of problems you can encounter when you're networking. Uh, you, know, you can have too many people on the Wi-Fi. You can have, I'm in a subway. You can have all sorts of things. Um, you can have uh, Facebook replace their SSL certificate and iPhones no longer support it. Um, and, and, you know, well, how do you figure that out, right? So some of these types of problems fail really quickly. Right? Like if if you can't find a host or the device is physically offline, it's going to be an instantaneous, nope, can't do that, and your app is going to continue on with whatever code you have to handle that error. Uh, sometimes your app will sit there for a minute, maybe two minutes, just waiting for the server to respond and never get a response in time. Uh, some in the middle, you know, you can get all these weird cases where like the server hits an error or SSL fails for some reason, right? Um, and so when you write code, you, have to, you really don't have control over that. You can't, you can't make it always work. So what you have to do is think about, you know, well, what are the boundaries on this, right? If, if I'm never, you know, if I'm making calls and I don't want the user to ever experience 30 seconds of waiting for something to happen, I can change the configuration for my networking in my app so that it automatically fails after 20 seconds, right? And that's not great, but it's better than waiting a minute and then having it fail. You know, the only time you wouldn't want to do that is if it's realistic to expect something to take 20 seconds to get to the server um, and back and still, you know, have it succeed, right? Or you could be really aggressive and say, it's not okay for anything to take 20 seconds to get the server and back, make it fail, and then when we see errors, we'll go and figure out how to fix that on our server so that it takes less time. Um, you know, performance as sort of a key metric. But, uh, you know, <laughs> then what happens, right? You have asked for something, you didn't get it back in your app, what do you do? You know, you can pop up an error that just says, sorry, that didn't work. Um, but is there anything else you can do, right? Sometimes it is a matter of just saying, sorry, we can't do anything more. Um, but still, you have an opportunity to, to really make either a really positive or a really negative reaction from your user, right? You have to disappoint them, but how you disappoint them really does matter. Um, 
as we just learned, mainstream users really don't like big text messages full of jargon that doesn't mean anything to them. Right? They don't really care that your server did A, B, and C. Um, they, they also tend not to like jokes in this situation, right? Because they were trying to get something done, and now we're trying to make light of the fact that we've wasted their time. Um, it's not that, like, <laughs> I kind of appreciate the jokes baked into software, but in general, it's like, you know, you have to appreciate how is the user feeling at this moment, because they've probably waited 60 seconds, and then the network connection dropped, and now we have to tell them, sorry, you just lost a minute of your life to us, and we're not going to give it back to you. Um, so they don't want a joke, they don't want jargon. What they want is something that helps them, right? So what can you do instead? You can give them a plan B. Uh, you know, if your app is all about booking travel, right? If you have this awesome like mobile app that's going to revolutionize the travel industry, it's great if someone can book all their travel with their thumb and never have to use their fingers or anything else. But if the final like buy the ticket button fails, what do you do next? You can tell them to try again and they probably get booted back to the beginning of your process, or maybe you remember all the details, but then when they try again in half an hour, you know, the ticket's been sold. Um, and you're probably the kind of company that doesn't have a giant, you know, support, like, phone bank waiting for people to call them and buy tickets, but you could always bundle that data up and ask the user to send it by email, right? And queue an email into their app box so that if and when their phone is able to send email, your tech support people get that, and they can take care of the customer, right? And it's not great, right? They didn't get their ticket right away, but you've said, hey, there's an email in your outbox, um, you know, go ahead and send it, and we will take care of you. We already have all the details, what you're trying to get done. Uh, you know, it's, it's a good way to recover from an inevitable problem that you're going to face. Uh, of course, if you're making like an e-reader and someone can't download your book, you're kind of out of luck. Can't offer to email it to them. It's just not going to work out very well. But again, you can give them a better sense of expectation, right? Sorry, we couldn't down your, download your ebook. Um, you know, if the phone is offline, you can figure that out, right? The, the error you got from that network request will tell you what happened. If the phone's offline, tell them, like, hey, it looks like there's a connection problem with your phone. Why don't you go troubleshoot that, and then after that's fixed, we should be able to download your ebook. Whereas if you got an error from your server, like you know your server returned a 500 error saying, sorry, something bad happened server side, hopefully you have some way of your you know, web developers knowing about that and fixing the problem, and you can set expectations differently. Right? You can say, sorry, we, we can't deliver your ebook right now. It looks like there's a problem on our end. Um, you know, Give it a try in an hour because we'll probably have been able to figure out what the issue is and fix it. So you're not setting them up to repeatedly try the same problem again. Right? You can think through and give them a little more context. So that's kind of networking. Um, again, you know, there's not that much you can do in all cases. You can do a lot of tuning. You can't prevent it from failing, but you can anticipate what is going to make someone's life a little less bad. Or just, you know, so much customer ex support is so bad in the world that even just giving someone a thoughtful, intelligent path toward expectations and how things are going to get resolved is a huge differentiator. Um, so let's talk about code execution. Uh, you know, the code runs on the device, right? And if you have a big image, it takes a while to read into memory and process. If you download a ton of data, it's going to take a while to get up and running. Um, so, you know, you have to think about how big are the images that you're downloading, right? Do you need a full-size image or would a thumbnail suffice? And can you get that thumbnail from the internet <coughs> instead of making it on the device after you've downloaded this big photo? That'll speed things up. Um, should you be processing them in the background instead of on the UI thread? Uh, but also, what about the data, right? If I'm downloading all my friends' contacts or if I'm downloading an RSS feed of news, how big could that be? Right? How do we control how much the app has to do and design the app's code so that it you know, runs well instead of poorly? Um, can your app defend from accidentally downloading three bajillion entries in an RSS feed? What happens? You probably run out of memory after about 30 seconds of trying to process this thing. 
Um, the, the example I like for this, um, I call it my coffee debugging story. And it, it goes something like this. Um, we were building an app that was designed to allow you to talk to your Facebook friends through other means. So we used Facebook Connect to get a user's information and get all of their friends who were on Facebook and figure out who they talked to and who they didn't and this stuff. Um, and we knew we'd have a lot of data and we were worried about memory usage. So we said, well, let's make sure we use SQLite in this so that we're storing this stuff as relational data and we can just pull in little bits and pieces. Um, so we did that. And if you ever used SQLite or Core Data, you know that it's very easy to write yourself into a hole and cause huge problems that you never expected because the database is actually really, really slow for the most part. Um, so we thought about that and we said, okay, we kind of optimize these, you know, we download all the user stuff and let's make sure we only write database updates for the users whose info has changed and we'll like optimize that and it was pretty fast and we were super excited about it and we're like, great. And then this could still be kind of slow, so let's do it in the background and there'll be like this one feature of the app that we don't enable until we've finished updating all that stuff. Cool. Okay. So we get to beta and we've got like 10 people using this thing and they're all kind of like high profile fancy people so we're trying to have like a really good beta experience for them because they're not going to give us the time of day if it's really, you know, bad out of the box. Um, and everything was going great except for this one guy in San Francisco who was like, this thing is infuriatingly slow, I hate it. So we went troubleshooting over the phone and email and stuff. And it turned out it was like, okay, I'm install it, reinstall it, great. Works great the first time, he closes the app, launches it again, and it's super slow. Okay, log out of Facebook, log back in. You know, long story short, we couldn't figure it out. So I happened to be going to San Francisco um, for a meeting, and I was like, great, let's just meet up for coffee and we'll figure this out. So we get to the coffee shop, get his phone, I plug it into my laptop, fire up the debugger, and about a minute later, I'm like, ah, I got it. But I look at him, and I say, okay, so, I asked him, how many friends do you have on Facebook? Anyone have a guess? Good guess. <laughs> 10,000. <laughs> so it turned out statistically that if you have 10,000 friends on Facebook, then several hundred of them will have updated their profiles every time you run our app. It's just the law of numbers. Um, <laughs> And even though our code was great, and even though it did stuff in the background, it still would sit there for like three minutes writing these updates out to the database. And you know, on a good day, it was 30 seconds, right? But he still couldn't do like the one key thing in the app he wanted to do as soon as it opened, and that frustrated him to no end. So the, the lesson I took from that is that you can never ever anticipate the edge, all the edge cases, right? People are always going to throw stuff at your app that you would never have thought of. I now know this one, right? But the next thing is going to catch me the next time. Um, and so, it's, as, as I said, it's the law of big numbers, right? Given a big enough operating environment, all possible scenarios will occur. Um, you know, somewhere in the world, my code from New Relic has reported the health of an app running down a sewer line. Someone has flushed their phone running an app, and it has reported health data back to us. It's like fascinating. It's like like, who knew that, you know, someday we would be reporting data from a phone, you know, running at 50 miles per hour down a tube? Um, <laughs> it's, but it is what drove me out of actually making apps and into building ways to understand how apps are performing in production. Because you can't make this up, and it wastes so much time and energy trying to troubleshoot these things. So, um, let's talk about the, the third type of problem. Right, slow device features. Uh, you know, web views uh, embedded within apps, or you know, we can get into the whole like web view versus native thing. Um, but web views are slow compared to the experience of throwing a native control up on a screen when you're already inside of a native app. Uh, cameras take time to initialize, right? They take time to, to focus and lock on and trigger the flash and all that stuff. Bluetooth takes time to find like your watch or your, your piece or whatever it is you're looking for. And, and GPS just takes forever no matter what you do. Um, so 
And what do you do with these things that aren't, that are really not under your control, that are just, you can't really tune for them, you can pick what hardware you'll support, and that's about the extent of it. So web views uh, are really useful when you want to integrate something into your app that you just don't want to build native code for, or it's hosted on a server, or whatnot, right? But the web views are really slow to initialize. And so often, you'll, you'll like be in your app, and you'll click a button, and it'll display a new view controller or a new activity, and smack dab full page, then, is this web view, which is slowly initializing the JavaScript engine and slowly loading the you know, HTML and the DOM for the first presentation. And the user's sitting there staring at a white screen for one or two or five seconds. And it's just not a great experience. Um, so there's a way to, to work around that, right? You have to go with sleight of hand. Uh, and what you do, you can throw a native control over the front of it that completely obscures the web view and show the user whatever you want while you're working in the background to get things up and running. Right? You could really do whatever you want there. You can put a nice little spinner that just says, like, please wait, we're loading the page. Um, or, you know, if that doesn't satisfy you, you can be playful here, right? Because someone's not frustrated yet. So what if your app downloaded a bunch of random tweets from a control feed? Or some, you know, the latest news from your site, and it just had that stuff kind of like playfully scrolling about on screen so someone could read it while you're waiting for the new thing to happen. And then once you've detected that that web view is all loaded up and ready and functioning, you just fade that out and take it off, right? And now the user's there, and you haven't done anything to speed up the web view, but you also haven't left the user just sitting there. Uh, you know, same thing with cameras, right? These take, everyone likes to take pictures, and like every app that a friend of mine asks me to check out and beta test has some kind of photo feature. <laughs> um, but initializing the camera takes time, right? And, and if you're on an older phone, it can take seconds and seconds, and no one wants that. Um, and then they add new features to the OS to do like image stabilization, and it takes even longer on the older hardware. So, uh, in this case, you know, you can't just like, present a loading screen over the camera necessarily. But you could, but if someone's really like, I'm ready to take the picture right now, then everything starts moving, and they're no longer ready to take the picture. Um, so you kind of have to think about things like, could I initialize the camera in the background before we even get to the point where the user's ready to take the picture? Uh, you know, or could I somehow have like a countdown screen that accommodates the longest possible setup time for the camera, and if the camera is set up before then, all right, well, someone's still waiting their five seconds for the countdown screen to get to zero, but the camera's all active and ready in the background. So I'm actually kind of shifting the burden onto the owners of the fast devices and saying, you know, it's okay if you take an extra second or two to get to what we want to show you as long as everyone gets the same kind of experience of it being smooth and nice. Um, and then there's big things like GPS, where Actually, recently this has gotten a lot better. Uh, I think Google and Apple and Microsoft and everyone have, have been doing a lot more interesting work with uh, Wi-Fi triangulation and pre-caching of data and all sorts of stuff to make GPS improved. But it still you know, can take 30 seconds for your phone to really figure out exactly where it is. Uh, or worse, it may take 30 seconds only to say, I have no idea where I am. Sorry. Right. And that's a really horrible experience, because 30 seconds is like forever when you're sitting there staring at your phone. Like you could walk an entire block and almost get hit by three cars staring at your phone while that happens. So it's at this point that you really have to think about this idea of sleight of hand. You know, how are you, how are you presenting a seamless experience to people when under the hood there's just a total mess? Um, and the question is really, how can you do that, right? Most of the stuff doesn't measure consistently. You know, how can you build a user experience when that camera setup or that GPS lock, it could take half a second, right? Or it could take a minute. And that's a vast difference in the perspective that someone has when they're sitting there staring at your screen. So this is where we get into the experimental part of the talk. Um, I actually have an idea on this that we've been practicing a little bit in New Relic and that I've used in a few personal apps. And it, it lies in this discipline called systems modeling. Has anyone here ever worked with systems theory or systems modeling? Three. Awesome. 
also. So, Russell Acuff, who is an operations theorist, said that managers do not solve problems, they manage messes. Right? And I, my modest suggestion is that the same holds true for mobile developers. Uh, right? This is a mess, and there's all these different bits and pieces of stuff that you really can't control. So, so what do you do about that? Your phone, your microphone goes down. So as a software engineer, I know I was conditioned to think about the processing of data via software with this nice, reliable, testable, predictable cycle where I develop code, right? I write the code, and then I test the code, and then I debug the code, and eventually I go out to this mythical beta land where other people evaluate the code for me. Um, but if you're like most mobile developers, I know that doesn't really cut it. That describes like the first half of your job. Right? And then the second half involves people complaining. Right? And fiddling with like these completely poorly documented APIs on the phone and just poking things with a stick to try and figure out how to make it faster, how to make it work, and how to make it consistent and reliable. And that's the mess that I mean when I say a mobile developer's job is to manage a mess. Um, yeah. So one more question. Is anyone familiar with Six Sigma? Wow, a lot more hands. Okay. Um, so, for those who don't know of this, um, I guess I would summarize it by saying it's a management practice. Uh, and there's all sorts of courses and books and retreats and stuff you can do on becoming better with Six Sigma. But I, you know, from like the five minutes I've learned about Six Sigma, I took away two lessons. Um, really, it's two simple goals. And the people who have like Six Sigma black belts will probably come over and hit me later. Um, the first goal is to reduce the standard deviation of your process, and the second goal is to increase the mean of that process. So what does that mean? It means first focus on getting rid of the things that change every time, right? Reduce the variability. Make it so that every time something runs, it runs consistently. Right? Then, once you've got that consistency and your app is like guaranteed to work at a consistent, predictable pace, then you can focus on speeding up the process, right? It's like avoiding premature optimization. Don't worry about the image processing code that you're writing until you know it's a problem. Worry about the fact that you're concatenating a ton of strings in memory and that that's 35% of your overall CPU usage for your app. True story. So don't optimize the mess because you can't reliably improve it. Instead, you have to figure out how to make it more continuous, right? make it consistent. And that brings us back to systems modeling. Systems theory uses, so using systems modeling, we can address the variability problem head on before we start actually designing and writing our code. Right? So systems theory overall is the science for modeling and understanding dynamic systems. And it, it turns out it's actually really pretty simple. Um, in a system like a bathtub, you have a stock. You have your bathtub, it's a big bucket. Right? You have flows, which are you know, the water coming into the bathtub from the faucet, and the water going out the drain. Right? And then there's this other stuff for like introducing feedback and delays. And you can model pretty much anything in the universe. Um, you know, a restaurant is a system designed to put food in your mouth. A football team is a system designed to score goals and enrich fans globally. And a mobile app is a collection of systems that each is intended to deliver some piece of functionality that hopefully is expressed in a user story that you and your team have thought through. Um, so using the systems models, you can build a much more reliable model of how your app is going to function before you actually get down to the code. So let's simplify things a bit, because four boxes is too many. Oops. So I'm going to stick with the stocks and the flows. Um, I think feedback is the thing that happens when people come to yell at you, and delays are what happens during testing and getting the product out to the app store. So we'll just ignore those for now. We'll focus on getting software built. So that leaves us with the stocks and the flows. Uh, stocks are the content that our apps process in this thinking. So you know, they're buckets full of data. Right? It's pretty simple. 
Um, and flows are the algorithms or the services or the IO operations that take that data and act on it in some way. So they move data from one stop to another. And a thin pipe, and, and then you know we model them based on size, right? So a big stock is a big chunk of data, and a small stock is a very small chunk of data. And a giant thick pipe is a really big flow that can move a ton of data fast, and a really small pipe is a really small flow that can only crunch one bit at a time. So using this, we can actually model a user activity in an app. Um, and <laughs> look at it as a system of stocks and flows, but why would we do that? Well, the goal is to estimate the relative complexity of each step in our app and the impact that that's going to have on everything downstream of it. So as I said, we can size these things, right? We can look at, yeah, this is a text message or a Twitter feed or a big old honking MP4 video. Um, and, you know, we can also model flows, right? A cellular connection, as I said, you know, it's pretty good at moving three or four pieces of data relatively slowly. Um, file I.O. is really good at putting a bunch of stuff on flash or getting it off, but it does have its limits, right? And then CPUs, you know, we have these like crazy four and eight core CPUs in mobile devices now, and they're capable of doing a lot of work, especially if you get into optimization and GPUs and all that stuff. Um, but it's important to model the fact that there's a bunch of cores only one of which is taking care of the screen and the user at any given time. So, how do we apply this? Because it's all hand waving at this point. Um, let's deconstruct a user flow of a user undergoing the act of taking a photo, tagging it with some metadata, like title, and then sharing it to their friends from their mobile app. Think so, okay. Take a photo, put it on a title, maybe record the place that it's taken in um, with the GPS and then share it out. Pretty simple. Um, you know, maybe it'll go to a website. Right. But there's a lot more going on under the hood than what we see up here. Uh, we're gonna use GPS and Foursquare to get the location. Right? We're going to uh, maybe add some automatic filtering, image processing to make the picture prettier. And then we need to actually upload the image and the metadata, and oh, by the way, we need to ask the user to input their title and confirm the location in Foursquare. So there's a bunch of stuff that needs to happen. Um, let's look at the stocks for this. There's the title. Um, there's the name of the place that this was taken. There's the image itself. And then there's the list of places that we're getting back from Foursquare that we're going to then try and auto-suggest and maybe ask the user to pick from. Right, so the title and the place name, they're little, they're simple strings, not a big deal. The image is potentially big, right, and we can immediately start thinking about what how big does it need to be. Do we need full camera res, or can we reduce it for web size before we upload it? And then there's this place list, which is you know, coming back from Foursquare. It's this deeply structured data structure with 50 or 100 locations. So it's kind of in the middle. right? It's, we're going to have to parse it and move it around and maybe provide a list of all this stuff. So then the flows, right, we have we talked about camera access, right? That is not super slow, but it's pretty variable. It can take a while. Uh, GPS is a very, very slow process for getting a very small amount of data. Uh, lookup to Foursquare can take a little while because it's a network request and Foursquare can sometimes be slow. And then image processing, right? If we have like a library to do this for us, it's going to be really efficient multi-core, et cetera, and then the image upload process, which is very slow over the cell network or faster over Wi-Fi. So let's lay this all out and look at what our user flow looks like. Uh, you know, we've got the camera, the image data, the processing, the titling, inputting the title, getting GPS lock, looking up a place, asking for the place, picking the place, and then uploading. So, you know, anyone who heard image processing probably started thinking, like, oh, let's make that fast. But there's a lot of other stuff going on in here, right, that's going to take much, much longer than just crunching data. In fact, we can time this stuff, right? We can go out and say, these are all of the critical steps in our user flow. Let's go write the trivialist, most, you know, inane, like, code to do each of these things one by one and time them. <coughs> And we come up with 85 and a half seconds. This is real. 
Um, and so now, suddenly, you can look at where you really have problems, and I guarantee you, you really have problems with GPS and talking to Foursquare and initializing the camera, and it turns out that you don't have problems with filtering because we have a filter library that someone already optimized for us. And then uploading, right? So there's a ton of stuff that has to happen. And it's a really frustrating process for someone because all they want to do is take a picture and share it and you're making them spend a minute and a half of their life with you. So, you know, let's say I've proven that the user experience will probably suck. Um, the good news is that I've done this in, you know, 10 minutes or an hour instead of actually writing the entire thing and then going out and testing it and determining that it sucks. So what do I do next? Well, let's look at the model and reason through some of the trouble spots, right? The image is big, and it's going to take a lot of time to work its way through the pipeline and down finally to the upload stage and then get pushed up to the server. Um, but I also need to pay attention to the places list, right? The place lookup has to happen after the GPS lock finishes and then finally get something on screen for the user to tap a button, right? So it's like, you know, what was that, like 50, 60 seconds waiting, followed by a short list, and we're almost guaranteed the user's going to tap top item because we're sorting those by proximity. Um, and in this case, I really don't need to worry about that image processing, right? We've proven that it's just a non-issue. So we can get into a bit of visual dependency analysis, and this is what's really cool about this. Thank you for sticking through this all. Um, Let's start by breaking this out into different dependency chains. Right? The image data comes from the camera and has to happen after the camera is initialized and before our image processing happens. But everything else, up until the upload bar, is disconnected. It's not part of the same flow. So we can break that out. right? And the same thing with the GPS lock, the place lookup, the place list processing, and then the place name selection by the user, that's all one contiguous flow, and you can't decouple that stuff. But it's completely decoupled from when the user types in the name of the picture that they want to share. And it doesn't have to wait for the image upload, obviously, but it also doesn't have to wait for the camera. So let's separate these things out into separate sub-processes. Right? And now, you can see where that start line for this user flow is. I've adjusted things. And the total time to execute this as three separate subtasks is way, way shorter. Right? I may be able to do things like fire up the GPS and start getting the location before the user even decides it's time to take a picture. You know, depending. Um, and in the process, you're going to discover these interesting hidden dependencies, right? So there are stocks of data that are orphaned here. What happens to the title? When do I send that to my server? You know, maybe I was assuming it would go with the image, but maybe it doesn't. Right? If, if the image goes to our media server and the metadata goes somewhere else, now I realize I actually have to do two network requests. You know, what happens to that stuff, right? Now we can take the title and say, oh, well, the location, that needs to get uploaded as metadata. It's completely decoupled from the image. And we can bundle the title in with the location and send those as one short little network request. And in the meantime, you know, maybe the image is finished because the user sat there at the screen deciding what their title was and they typed in text. Um, so something else just happened, too. Aside from figuring out how to make our app flow more, more speedily, uh, is we just defined our server API. <coughs> We didn't have to think about, well, what all this data we're going to push, and, and let's go write something, and then we'll write the app and find out we forgot how to connect point A to point B and, and get all the data coordinated. We've defined our API. Right? So we now have our spec for how this data is going to be stored on the internet and shared with people. But of course, this isn't always so easy. You have to experience some of this to, to figure out how to work with it. But the thing that I really like about it is, uh, you know, not all performance problems will show up in this model, but a whole lot of interesting things do. And by thinking about those ahead of time, um, you can, you know, you can avoid this problem of the limits of the brain, right? Our brains are not good at reasoning about software complexity. Um, 
It's really easy to build things that have emergent properties we didn't expect. Right? And so as the user stories become more and more complex, this is a tool that I've used to help simplify things and be able to discuss them on screen or on a whiteboard instead of in you know, a prosaic spec. Um, the designers I've worked with really love this because they do all of their interaction design and we come up with these great user flows. And then what we do is we do this kind of model and you start to say, okay, well, bullet points you know, 1, 5, 6, and 8 from this user flow are all part of the same subflow. And technically, those things have to be tightly coupled. But we can break that out from you know, 2, 7, 8, and 9. And now let's talk about the user experience design for presenting these things out of order, right? or changing step 3 to step 1 so that technically it works better. Right? It's sort of like going back to your product manager and saying, I know you wanted this, but if we do like something that gets 95% of the way there, I can have it to you in the tenth of the time because that last 5% is crazy. You can do that with a, you know, a, user, a, you know, a user design specialist, right? And have that same kind of intelligent conversation rather than, eh, it doesn't feel right. I'm not sure how we're gonna make that happen. Yeah, remember the coffee shop. So, uh, this practice leads to a lot of great things, right? We talked about the API design coming out of this, but what about fault tolerance? Right? What happens if that blue network bar breaks, right? If that breaks before the user has typed in the title of the picture, we can prevent them from going further down the path of a bad experience, right? So if you can think about, well, we're uploading the image, oh, and that totally failed. Let's let the user know that we couldn't store the image on our server. They can decide whether to like, continue on with the process of sharing this, which probably isn't gonna work, but might or save the picture locally and then come back to it later. Right? Those are the kinds of things you can model out with this and start thinking about how do we make life a little better for people. Um, and you know, the dependency analysis is really interesting on these kinds of things. You can do a mental exercise thinking about the performance of this flow on an iPhone 6 Plus with like super mega ultra camera versus a little $50 LG Android phone that literally takes 10 seconds to open the shutter. Uh, and, and you can decide, you know, well, do we want to make everyone wait 10 seconds and serve everyone an equally pleasant experience? Or do we want to make it fast but kind of entertain people in the meantime? Or do we want to taunt them because they need a better phone? Uh, you know, if we're a reseller, we might want to taunt them and convince them to upgrade. Uh, so, you know, once you have the complexity and the performance modeled like this, you can explore all these other avenues and start to have different tools for thinking about you know, the user experience and how to optimize and how to hide the inevitable problems and, and gritty areas. So, uh, to summarize, you know, begin with the user stories that describe what your app will do. Uh, I know, you know every designer I talk to loves this idea. Many developers I talk to love it. Many developers hate it. Um, what you will with that. But it, it does have its value. Um, and then by modeling the stocks and flows, you can understand better what you're actually proposing to do with the hardware at your disposal. And then focusing on decreasing the variance and increasing the niceness of the experience will really get you very, very far. And once you've done that, then is the time when you start beta testing things with a stick because it's not working like you expected you get much more interesting problems much more quickly. So, if you find the systems theory stuff interesting, um, I highly recommend this book, uh, Thinking in Systems by Dana Meadows. Uh, it's a pretty quick read, and it just it's fantastic in how it gets you thinking about how systems work and how to model the world. Um, secondly, if you choose to do anything with this, let me know, because uh, I don't know of anyone else I've talked to who's doing this, so I'd love to see how it works for you in practice. Um, yeah, and I, I just can't stress enough how much I think this will help your users and your teams benefit from the process. Um, and if you're interested in working with this stuff, I am also hiring. So, <laughs> thank you.
Excellent. What a great presentation. Thank you very much. Um, so we have some time for questions and answers. Does anyone have any questions? I'll see if the microphone works. It does. Okay. Um, so I'm curious what you're finding in terms of, uh, you didn't want to talk about um, native versus uh, web stuff, but uh, Amber, Angular, React, there's a whole bunch of frameworks that have been really kind of picking up steam the past six to 12 months. And how are you seeing that impact the, the um, approach that people take in terms of asynchronous, uh, you know, client-side device uh, modeling? That is an excellent question. Um, so it's interesting, actually. We have uh, we have a completely separate new like, product called Browser, which actually does performance management and measuring of how JavaScript and DOM activity and Ajax works inside of the browser page. Um, and we have yet to take that and do like a big thorough look at global performance of those. Um, but you know, I think there's, I sort of see it as kind of a split. Um, the, the transition to things like, uh, Angular is the one I have the most experience with, uh, you know, client-side JavaScript app frameworks. Uh, has made it much easier to build much more powerful front-end applications without continuously hitting your server. So on the one hand, there's this great reduction in all the latency where every time I tap a button, uh, you know, I wait for five seconds while the phone powers up the radio and talks to our server and comes back with data. Um, so it actually it has a tremendous implication for the, the, the speed with which the app can go through a process on the phone. Um, where I think you have to be really careful is, at the same time, what we're doing is we're actually adding a ton of new computation burden on the device itself, right? And especially with things like Angular, where you have this like double-sided data binding, and you know, you can you can very easily write extremely extremely complex activity that's executing in JavaScript on the phone, and that's not exactly fast. Um, and you can also have this two megabyte initial application load, right? which even if it's being pulled out of the phone because you've bundled your you know, Angular app inside of a native wrapper on the phone, you still then have to like initialize the, the web view and parse through this huge pile of JavaScript and assets to get the application on screen. So I think it has a huge amount of potential, um, but the, the, the need to, to really be careful is still there and is even worse perhaps. statistics we see. Yeah, yeah. Um, we do some marketing work that involves things like sort of state of the industry type data. Um, we publish some very high level numbers like which carrier has the worst response time and which country has the biggest error issues, um, you know, which phone has the fastest upload speeds. Um, but we don't, we haven't really made a habit of it, so it's not a very sort of continuous thing that we're doing tends to be more like around, you know, around September every year when Apple ships new hardware, we go in and take a look and try and come up with some data on how, you know, the iPhone 6 compares to the Nexus 6, just to, you know, raise people's hackles and start a Twitter store. Okay, thank you.